I'm excited today to have Jeff Chilton on the show. Jeff is the president of Namex and a mushroom expert. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, Nick, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Great, great. So Jeff, let's start off with something easy that I ask all guests on the Mind Body Peak Performance Show. What are the non-negotiable things that you've done for your health and performance today? Well, uh, <laughs> number one would be I, I always have coffee in the morning. That is absolutely non-negotiable. <laughs> and and the, beauty, the beauty of that, Nick, is that I'm constantly reading new studies that come out that talk about the tremendous benefits of coffee. And, and the last one, which I really love, said the, you get the most benefits by drinking at least three cups. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I drink at least three cups in the morning for sure. <laughs> I don't drink it in the afternoon or anything. In the afternoon, I have tea, green tea. But um, no, coffee for me is uh, absolutely non-negotiable. Me too. And I recently switched to a late afternoon matcha, which I've been really enjoying. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, matcha's great. Yeah, I like green tea with, I just have leaves. And, and so I throw them in and then my, my glass of water is like I've got these leaves floating around at the bottom. But it's, it's like, I like that. that. That's where you get the whole expression of somebody talking about reading the tea leaves, right? After you're finished, you throw them out and you, you read them, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised there's nothing to do with mushrooms on your non-negotiable routines. <laughs> no, well, I mean, yeah, you could say uh, uh, don't ever try to keep me from eating mushrooms. That's pretty non-negotiable. I mean, they are a major part of my diet and I eat them almost every day. I'll be eating mushrooms. I eat a lot of mushrooms as well, but I don't have the same experience and background with mushrooms. How did you get started? Well, I, I grew up in Seattle in the Pacific Northwest, and that's a place where the climate is perfect for wild mushrooms because we've got a temperate, rainy climate, which mushrooms like. So in the fall, there's mushrooms up everywhere. And so I did a little bit of hunting when I was younger. And then when I went to university, I studied anthropology, uh, but I still had an interest in mushrooms. So they had a great mycology department. So I took some courses in mycology. I put the two together which, and, and studied the use of mushrooms in cultures worldwide for food, for medicine, and in a shamanic uh, curing rites. And, and that was really interesting as well. I mean, there was a lot of information in the 60s coming out about shamanism, and a lot of us were quite interested in that from a personal standpoint <laughs> as well as studying. <laughs> So before you got started, I guess during those foraging experiences, did you did the mushrooms call you, so to speak? And th is that what interested you? Well, you know what? I, I think the, the real calling was when a friend of mine, when I was in high school, came back from Mexico and said, hey, I, now he's down there at a university for summer school. He said, hey, while I was there, I, I ate some magic mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, what what magic mushrooms that's pretty weird and then you know look the uh those of us of my generation we grew up in the 50s with walt disney and uh geez he had uh, that uh, wonderful show about uh, alice in wonderland right yeah I mean, I mean, it's like, if that's not giving something away, what is it? Huh? You know, it's yeah. like, oh, huh. It's got a mushroom that's smoking a hookah and she's like, <laughs> or a, a, a caterpillar that's smoking a hookah sitting on a mushroom. Yeah. Yeah. And to, and the, she, to little kids, it's not that obvious, but as you get older, you start to connect the dots and realize what, what that means. Yeah, exactly. And that, that actually, that story with the book that it came from, yeah, he actually was uh, eating mushrooms. No question about it. <laughs> and then where would you go from there? Well, I, um, <clears throat> basically when I graduated from university, I, I spent a year and a half in Mexico which was uh, quite a wonderful experience, just kind of very low key, Mexico on a dollar a day kind of thing. Wow. Uh, uh, it was a great time for travel for those of us at that period of time, whether it was Mexico or Europe or wherever. And, and a lot of it too was uh, going back into the mountains looking for mushrooms. Um, and then when I got back from Mexico, you know, what do I do for a job? And I thought, well, man, I'd really love to learn how to 
grow mushrooms. That'd be so cool. So I went to the only mushroom farm in Washington state, applied for a job, got a job, which I just like stoked. This is awesome. And then I, I was there for the next 10 years wow. living with mushrooms. I mean, literally living with mushrooms and, and mushrooms on a mushroom farm, a big mushroom farm, 2 million pounds of agaricus mushrooms per year that was being grown there. And mushrooms do not sleep. They just carry on and go through their growth cycle. So you have to have people there, like an army of people to harvest them. Every single mushroom mm. that we've eaten has been picked by hand. Why is that? Well, well, basically they have not been able to develop a harvesting machine because in a bed of, of mushrooms, you have these mushrooms coming up and they're in different stages of development. So let, let's say you went, okay, we'll just take a knife and go down there. Well, you, you might be harvesting some of them at the right stage of maturity, but you'd be cutting the heads off of others. So, so it's really all, all of the mushrooms today with the exception of a few really advanced farms in Holland where they've kind of figured out a, a but it's a very expensive machine that they've got in this expensive type of growing method but otherwise they're all harvested by hand and and, and that's that's a really major bottleneck uh, yeah. in uh, the whole mushroom and so 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 basically they're harvesting every day of the year it does not stop. They're there. They're there. Christmas, New Year's, you name it. They're there harvesting mushrooms. That's incredible. And I guess unlike tr like most plants, you don't just put a seed in the ground and there's not a predictable growth cycle. You can't say after X number of days, we can come back here with the machinery and chop everything down. Absolutely right. Because, because what's happening is every crop is on a 90 day cycle. So let's just say every week you're putting in eight different crops that'll go into different rooms and then there will be eight crops that are being thrown out uh, after they're finished so you just got this continual cycle going on so so you never really get a chance to like in a normal crop that you plant outside in a field and, and maybe over the course of uh, a lifetime a farmer sees 50 to 60 different crops. Well, we're, we're seeing uh, 400 different crops in a year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's for insane. The, for the listeners who are missing out in the visual experience, what is that machine behind you, Jeff? Over here? Yeah. I'm guessing it's mushroom related. Yeah. Actually, it's called a laminar flow hood. You ever heard of uh, a laminar flow hood? No. It's really cool because when you're doing um, sterile culture work, one of the things, you know, you've got Petri plates and maybe you're, you're using spores to grow mushrooms or you're taking a piece of tissue to grow a mushroom. Well, if you're doing it in a normal room, normal environment, the air around us, Nick, is just absolutely full of all sorts of spores and bacteria, you name it, uh, dust particles. If it gets onto that plate, it will contaminate it. So in that unit there, there is a high efficiency, it's called a HEPA filter. And when I turn that on, it's blowing air down and essentially I'm working in clean air. So mm -hmm. I can do all of my culture work in these plates and not worry about any kind of contamination. I'm guessing the farms have something similar. Well, you know what? Those those are, are utilized primarily when you're making uh, mushroom spawn. And, and, you know, it's kind of like, how do we grow mushrooms? <laughs> they don't have seeds. What do we do? Spores, so, right? so, so what happens is uh, uh, we use live mycelium as our seed. But what, what we have to do is we have to put that mycelium on some kind of a carrier material because you know you, you just can't grow out mycelium and then dry it and and mix it in you have to put it on something that that will then help you spread it and, and so you'll put it for example on sterilized grain you grow the mycelium on that and then that that one jar of grain will have let's say three or four thousand separate kernels each kernel is is covered with some mycelium and then you can mix that up into your substrate 
which is the, the medium that we're feeding to this uh, uh, mushroom organism. And, and so that's primarily used to make spawn and to, you know, you know, the, the cool thing about mushrooms is that I can go out and get a wild mushroom. I can bring it back into my lab and then I can take a, a piece of tissue from the inner part of that mushroom. I can put it on a Petri plate. It will grow out. So it'll grow out into mycelium. And then um, I've got a clone of that mushroom just from the tissue. And just for your, for your listeners, just so they know, I mean, the, this whole organism that we call a mushroom, it starts from spores. Um, mushrooms don't have seeds. So the spores go out, they land on the ground, they land in a piece of wood. When conditions are right, those spores will germinate into very fine thread-like filaments called hyphae. When multiple filaments fuse and come together, they'll form a, a network. And that network of these uh, hyphae, these very fine filaments, we call mycelium. That's, that's the actual vegetative body. And in a sense, you can almost look at them um, to some degree like a root system or something. But they're in their food source, buried in it. We normally don't see mycelium because it's either underground or it's in a piece of wood. All we see is the mushroom when it comes up. And so when conditions are right, like in the fall in the Seattle area, up comes this mushroom and we go like, where'd that come from? What's going on? You know, it's not like an apple coming off. We can see the tree and we pull the apple down, right? No, it's like this mushroom comes up. And we're like, what, where did you come from? What's going on, right? So, so up comes this mushroom and it uh, goes through its cycle of about two weeks to go from just a small little, what we call a pinhead to a mature mushroom that the cap opens up, there's gills underneath, out come the spores. Now we have this life cycle completed. And what's, what's interesting and what's important about this is we've got three, what we call plant parts. We've got spore, we've got mycelium, and we've got mushroom. And in, in the whole marketplace of, let's just say, supplements and herbal products, the plant part is very important because, because each part will have a different amount of the beneficial compounds we're looking for. So, so when, you, when you buy ginseng, for example, you are looking for the root. <laughs> you're not looking for the leaves or the flowers or anything like that. With echinacea, you're looking for the flowers. Uh, with ginkgo, actually ginkgo, it's the leaf. So that's very important to know when you're looking for a particular supplement product, what plant part is in here. And that's something that they have to tell you. That's something that definitely they, they have to tell you. That's part of the regulations. I first came across mycelium and the fascinating world of fungi in Paul Stamets' book, Mycelium Running. And I realized that when you see a mushroom of, above the surface, really there's a whole network going on underground. He calls it the original internet. How would you describe the role the mycelium networks play? Uh, it's a little bit, uh, let's just say, fanciful to call it the, the, the Earth's internet because for one, it's not going through the oceans. <laughs> For two, the, the other thing about mycelium is, look, um, <clears throat> mycelium of one species, when it meets another species, there is what's called a zone of inhibition. They do not come together. They do not like go, oh, hey, let's exchange information. No, uh -huh. if they were able to exchange information like fused together, that would mean they are the same species. <laughs> That's uh. just, you can't do that. So, so the thing is, is yes, there's a lot of mycelium out there under the ground. I, I think what he actually is sort of getting at is it's a very, uh, the, the network that it forms is one of these networks where it's just not linear. Uh, ultimately, this mycelium will branch off in every direction so that one part of it it doesn't have to take only one road back to the beginning. There's multiple ways it can get back to the beginning if it needed to get there, which it really doesn't. Because the whole thing with, with mycelium is it's spreading out in search of nutrients. 
and each species, the mycelium of each species has a different set of enzymes because some species decompose wood, some species decompose uh, certain leaves, others are in soil. So every species has a different set of enzymes uh, and if a certain species is put into the ground and it's a wood decomposer, it is not going to grow. So, so it can, you know, let, let's say that there's log laying out there on the ground and it's, it's just consumed this log. And then it's like, okay, where do I go to next? Oops, <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I can't get into that soil because I can't attack the nutrients in there. So, so it's kind of like locked into that wood and then basically it will die and become food for something else. And the mycelium will become food for other things as well. And, you know, I like to look at it as, as, there's a, a ecosystem out there that is decomposing all of the organic matter that comes down every year. And, and we're talking about bacteria. We're talking about this mycelium. And the mycelium could be of a, of a division of fungi that actually produces a mushroom. And there are, there are other types of fungi that it's the mycelium only. They never produce any, any type of structure like a mushroom. And, oh. and what we do is we call those molds. So when um. you see a green mold, you're never going to see a mushroom coming up off of that mold. What you will see is, um, you know, you pull out your bread and, and one day maybe it's like, okay, you see a little white whatever growing on it, whatever and you then a couple of days later you pull it out and all of a sudden it's like green it's this big patch of green well the green is actually the color of the spores and 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 when you open that bag and you pull it out all of a sudden there's a cloud and you're like holy shit what is that well those are the spores and when people say they have mold issues that's the issue the issue are the spores so that's what you don't want to be breathing in those spores now, now normal life we're breathing in spores all the time but not in seriously damaging concentrations like if you've got these things growing in your bedroom and every night you're breathing these things in that's not good uh, just like if you're in a mushroom house and you're growing oyster mushrooms and oyster mushrooms have a cap that's just it's open all the time so as soon as it's ready to produce spores it's open and ready to go and and that house is full of oyster mushroom spores and you have to protect yourself if you're in there harvesting them because they will get into your lungs and they will irritate you and some people will be more affected by it than others um so, uh, you know, and that's why the, the Agaricus mushroom, we call it the button mushroom. It's, it's a immature mushroom The it has not opened up. What we do see sometimes is that portobello, which is this big, huge mushroom that's open and you turn it over and there's all the gills and there it's brown on the underside. That's a mature mushroom that they've allowed to mature. They call it a portobello just to fool people. <laughs> It's actually an agaricus. It's the uh, same as the button mushroom. It's just mature. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So the portobello, the other one that they sell is called the cremini. Yep. And, and the cremini is just a, a variety that's brown instead of white. So they're all three the same species of mushroom. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it's but it's you know it's just like really good marketing. <laughs> yeah. The mold isn't necessarily dangerous if it's in a high concentration. I thought it, it depends if there's certain like active ingredients or toxins in the concentration that you inhale. Well, no, the, you know, where, where we see toxins generally are, there are certain molds that, for example, will get in and they'll live in grains. And they're, they're in there long enough that they start to produce toxins as secondary metabolites. Mm -hmm. But when you're just breathing in spores now, now uh, there are, um, you know, there are, are uh, definitely 
examples of where maybe spores get into somebody's lungs and maybe they germinate in there and, and maybe there'll be toxins. But generally, if you're, if you're breathing them in, your body can take care of that and, and deal with it because we're dealing with it all the time. We don't see it, but the air we breathe is actually a soup. There's, I mean, it's just like if you're, if you're uh, in the springtime and you're in a place where there's trees that, that have a lot of pollen and you can see at times the cloud of pollen that's coming off those trees. And that's why people have hay fever. They're, they're breathing in this. So people, some people are much more sensitive to that than others. Just like some people have allergic reactions to certain foods and others do not. Yeah. So if I pull something moldy out of the fridge, say a moldy piece of fruit, I don't need to hold my breath and worry about inhaling some of the spores. Well, well, you know what? Not really. I mean, you can take it, lift it out and, and put it in your compost or, or wherever. It's not like the, the attack of the killer spores. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's uh, again, you pretty much, you know, it's like we've all been exposed to bread molds, right? And uh, we're exposed to these mold spores all the time. But it's, it's, it's basically if you're in an environment where it's loaded, you're breathing them in regularly, and they can create issues uh, in your lungs. Let's go back to your experience with mushroom. Nobody was really in that business in 1989 when I started my company. I mean, I was pretty much the first, if not one of the couple that were doing it. So, so I'd go out at a trade show trying to introduce medicinal have you ever heard about the medicinal mushrooms uh reishi you ever heard of reishi mushroom now what is it oh have a look oh yeah what's that is that, that like a piece of wood what what is it, it doesn't look real <laughs> yeah I, I know it's so it's a dried reishi mushroom and it's very woody yeah I, i've never heard of that before but uh kind of nobody's nobody's asking for those why should i put out a product if nobody wants it <laughs> so that was what it was like in the very beginning trying to to introduce and so most of the early 90s was spent trying to educate the market and educate all of these companies that had supplement products that were based around green herbs nobody had a mushroom in their product line so that was a really big part of what i was doing was just educating getting getting books written getting articles written getting as much information out there to the industry as possible so that ultimately they would pick up and have a mushroom in their product line. And it took a number of years, but by the end of the 90s, lots of companies at that point in time were putting out mushroom products. And especially in the last few years, it's really accelerated. How do the medicinal benefits of dried powders, the extracts, compare to the wet mushrooms? The thing about eating mushrooms, a couple of things, one of which is they're not highly digestible. And mushrooms are very high in fiber. So you're, you're going to be getting a lot of fiber, which is a good thing because it's we, we need fiber. It feeds the microbiome. You're not necessarily, though, getting as much of the benefits as you might want and, and depends on how often you happen to be eating them. So if I'm selling you a mushroom extract and if it's a concentrate, well, now let's just say I, I'm giving you a uh, something that you're going to be getting instead of um, 10 or 20 grams of fresh mushrooms, you'll be getting that in a couple of capsules, you know, 500 milligrams, a thousand milligrams, something like that. You know, I encourage people before they even supplement, I encourage them to put mushrooms into their diet because I, I really think mushrooms are the forgotten food. I call it the, the missing dietary link <laughs> <laughs> and, and really a forgotten food. So I always say, first thing you do, eat mushrooms. And have you ever had the shiitake mushrooms? Yeah. Man. Wonderful. Uh, I mean, geez, they are so delicious. <laughs> yeah. I, I was actually eating fresh shiitake in the 70s because we had a scientist at the mushroom farm from Japan. And he was growing shiitake and oyster mushroom and enoki taki. So that was really, you know, and I love shiitake. I say, buy shiitake, put that into your diet. But, but essentially, when we're selling these extracts, a couple of things are going on, one of which we are testing them for the beta-glucans that are in there. And, and, and beta-glucans uh, make up 50% of the cell wall 
of mushrooms and they are the important compound that you're looking for. They are what make mushrooms immunologically active. If you don't have any beta-glucans in your product, you're, you don't have a medicinal mushroom, period. Um, so, so we can actually provide the benefits of mushrooms in a supplement form. You know, you know and, and look, when you think about the herbal market and stuff, well, there's lots of herbs out there that we could be consuming sort of as foods. And, and my, my whole um, philosophy is food is medicine. You know, I mean, I mean that's, that's what we're looking for. We want something that when we're eating it, that's going to nourish us in not just nutrients, but also medicinally. So I, that's why I think mushrooms are such a wonderful food because they give us both. So, uh, but with the supplements, we can, we can basically process them to make them a little more bioavailable. And then you don't necessarily have to take as much. And maybe it's uh, for you when you're traveling or something, it's convenient too, to have, to have that uh, um, bottle of capsules or that, uh, that uh, extract powder, something like that. I do exactly that. I added some lion's mane to my morning coffee. And when I'm traveling, I bring the Real Mushrooms Five Defenders product, which has a bunch of different ones. Five Defenders is a great product. Yeah, that's that's really good. And and you know, it, it's interesting because <clears throat> there are companies out there that will have like seven mushroom combo, ten mushroom combo, twenty five. Yeah, the, the 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 most I've seen has been twenty four. <laughs> There's another one that's like sixteen or seventeen, and it's just like you know what that's the kitchen sink and, and it just the more you add the more it devalues the top species that you really want so it, it's more of a, a marketing gimmick than anything else it's kind of like you know people think oh the more the better and it's just not true so i, I always you know put the limit at right around five and i think any any you go beyond five and you're really just diluting the higher quality ones with a lower quality one, especially when it comes to the beta glucans. Either that or the serving size is going to be very <laughs> hefty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so I, I tell people just avoid those products and, and look for, you know, the five defenders. I, li I like that product. It's got the sort of the five top ones for immunological activity. And that's kind of how it is sent, uh, sold. And those are all kind of our top extracts, the uh, concentrates there. So it's a good product. Tell us about the difference between Namex, your company, and Real Mushrooms. Well, we're the same company. The difference is, is that Namex supplies bulk extract powders to other companies. So we're what's called a raw material supplier. And then Real Mushrooms is, is a retail division of Namex and Real Mushrooms sells the products retail through uh, online sources, you know, or the own or website, Amazon, places like that. And, and you know, what happened, uh, because we just started that up about six years ago, was that for many years, I had people calling me and saying, hey, you know, I've got this disease or that disease, and can you help me? I've heard medicinal mushrooms are really good for my immune system. And do you, what can you do? And I'm like, you know, well, I'll, I'll, you know, give you the name of one of my customers or something, but it was kind of like, well, okay. Yeah. So I never, I never really wanted to do that until my son got involved in the company and, and, and he was like, Hey, I'd really like to develop a retail line. And I went, great, let's do it. So we developed a retail line and, and yeah, it's done really well. It's, it's great. And I really, you know, and he's, he's done a great job with it. And, and, uh, he, he's my exit strategy of ultimately <laughs> moving on to more trout fishing. <laughs> <laughs> it comes full circle. When I was researching a type of mushroom called cordyceps, yep. I was looking at the different suppliers of it and how to vet and find high quality suppliers. And all sources pointed back to Namex being the most price to va the best price to value ratio because wild cordyceps is outrageously expensive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and not only that, look, the, the other thing, too, is in the market, there's a lot of products out there that the mycelium that's grown on sterilized grain, and we talked about that earlier as 
the seed that is used for growing mushrooms, but there are companies in, in the U.S. that will grow that out and then they will just dry it, grind it to a powder, grain and all, and, and sell it as mushroom. And that's the thing that you really have to look out for because if you see one of these products, if it says mycelium, and then you look in the other ingredients and it says rice or oats or something like that, well, you're mostly getting rice or oats, unfortunately. And rice and oats, oats are starch. Mushrooms don't have starch. That's really cool. Mush, you know, th this is one of those little interesting facts. Mushrooms have glycogen as a storage carbohydrate like humans and they breathe like humans they they're basically taking in oxygen giving off carbon dioxide so they Whoa. share some certain attributes with us and uh, you know they have their own kingdom that's sitting right between plants and animals and there they are fungi and it's, it's, you know and and look let's face it they they are a very interesting very different some people might say an oddity of sorts <laughs> the most mysterious for sure yeah but they're they're really kind of cool when you when you think about it and they, they come in all sorts of different forms too not just the classic form they're, they're like some that grow right off the side of trees as a what we call a conch or a shelf or bracket fungus things like that so they and, and colors i mean there are actually people that make dies from mushrooms oh hmm. yeah yeah because some mushrooms have these these pigments in them and so they'll make dyes from those wow how do you go about evaluating mushroom products say i want to go out and buy a new one and i want to do my research beforehand make sure i'm getting good value what do i look for on the label you already mentioned that there shouldn't be oats or wheat or any of these other things under the other ingredients but how else do I know? A couple things. One of the things that we do is we test all of our products that we make for beta glucans. So, so look for a company that, that will actually give a, a amount of beta glucans on that. Like all of our real mushroom products will say not less than X amount of beta glucans and also a product that says no grain, no have it right here. starch. <laughs> there you go. No grain, no starch, no mycelium. That would be another thing to look for. And, and, you know, the funny thing is, is that if the product says made in the USA, unfortunately, it's going to be one of those grainy products. And I like to, to look at them and describe them as tempeh. You, 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 are you familiar with tempeh? Do you eat tempeh? I don't eat it, but I'm familiar with it. Okay. Do you know how it's made? No. <laughs> I know a lot. Some people do. It's it's interesting. But the tempeh is just cooked soybeans with fungal mycelium grown on it. So if you're eating tempeh, you are eating mycelium. But if you look at a block of tempeh, you you, you know when you're eating it, you're eating mostly soy. Um, so this is what these products are like. It's it would be like taking tempeh drying it, grinding to it to a powder and selling it as a mushroom. That's what's going on. And, and, and that's the, the big issue is if that's what you want, buy it. That's fine. But it's not mushroom. It's definitely not mushroom. So you're not getting the benefits of the mushroom because the mycelium does not produce the active compounds in the same amounts that the mushroom does. You know, it'd be kind of like, you look, anybody that's interested in a magic mushroom or something like that. Yeah. Are you eating mycelium? Uh, on grain? <laughs> no, you want the mushroom, right? So if that's the way things are done in the U.S., where do you source your mushrooms? You know, look, because I'm a mushroom grower by trade and because I know the economics of it, that's the real issue is that you cannot grow mushrooms in the U.S., and then sell them in the supplement space. It's just too expensive. If you, you know, you can sell a mushroom, let's say a pound of mushrooms for $5, but when you dry that out, supplements are dried powders. You dry that out. Now you have to get $50 for the same pound of mushrooms. So the economics mm. don't work. I realized this after um, I went to China and I went 
you know, there's no way I could grow these mushrooms and do it economically. So I got together with, uh, you know, all through the 90s, I, I met all sorts of people over there, farmers and processors and went to a lot of uh, conferences. And I made a lot of really great connections. And so I contracted for mushrooms to be grown over there. And then in 1997, I took OCIA, the largest organic certifier in the United States over with me. And we had the first organic certification workshop for oh. mushrooms in China in 1997. And the, the mushrooms are not certified by Chinese certifiers or anything like that. No, it's like European certifiers, right? So, and, and plus where we grow these mushrooms, it's really interesting, man, when, when we go out to the farms, it's like almost the end of the road back in the mountains. It's really interesting where they're grown, where these mushroom houses, and we grow them all very naturally. We don't grow them indoors in warehouses or anything like that. We grow them in shade houses where we've got fresh air coming in and we've got uh, light. Um, it's a very natural method of growing the, the mushrooms are actually grown according to the season so reishi loves hot temperatures it's growing during the summertime and and when it's harvested right early september i mean during the time it's growing it's like 80 degrees or 85 it is hot and humid reishi loves that um but when it comes to shiitake or maitake no, they, they like maybe 60 degrees, 65 degrees. So they are grown in the fall and harvested in November. Huh. Lion's mane likes it even cooler. So lion's mane isn't harvested until the first week or last week in November, first week in December. So it, it's really the thing I love about it. It's such a natural process that we're That's using amazing. to grow the mushrooms. We're not in these big warehouses where we've got air conditioning and heating and we've got uh, fresh air being pumped in and the humidifiers and all the rest. Nothing like that at all. It's, it's in very natural conditions and we grow everything for the most part on sawdust or wood of some sort medicinal mushrooms it's really kind of cool uh, nick medicinal mushrooms are growing on wood for the most part huh yeah wood it's like okay interesting so you need that wood to have the precursors to make those medicinal compounds that are in those mushrooms so so we're growing them on natural materials it's it's a wonderful cycle because mushrooms are nature's recyclers and so in terms of a sustainable crop mushrooms are basically taking all of those agricultural waste products out there and converting them into high quality food or supplements and then when you're finished they've broken down that sawdust or the wood log and now it can be either put in the fields uh, as a as a fertilizer as a soil amendment and sometimes what they do if it's growing on wood logs is they dry out what's left of that log and they use it to uh, fire up the dryers that they're using to dry the mushrooms what an elegant system Oh God, I love it. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it, are you familiar at all with permaculture? Yeah. It's, it's in a way that's kind of how it's being done. It's, it's kind of permaculture. In fact, sometimes I've seen shiitakes put in place ready to grow because they've gone through their incubation period in a rice paddy after they've harvested the rice <laughs> and the rice harvest is over. They'll put a shade house up and they'll put the shiitake on that same piece of ground it's just like wow so cool yeah it really is and you know part of it it's almost like working with people that have got thousands of years of working with the land and they are just as close to the land as anybody can be they've been living there for generation after generation working the land it's it's pretty fascinating and and so interesting how it's all being done are mushrooms bioaccumulators meaning that they soak up 
like heavy metals and other contaminants around well them? well some of them are more than others and, and so that's why a lot of times you'll hear people say look don't eat mushrooms that are growing on the side of the highway unless they're magic mushrooms <laughs> 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 because then then it's like okay one and out or whatever but no that they can be so so if if they're growing from a substrate that is high in certain heavy metals they could be pulling those out because it's like you know any plant not just mushrooms the mineral profile of what that plant is sucking up mineral wise is really dependent on what's in that soil so, so it's really hard at times to talk about certain plants and say, okay, there's, there's always, here's, here's the profile you'll always find. Well, you can get a general profile, but that profile will change depending on the soil and what's actually yeah. in the soil mineral wise or, or in that tree, you know, how long has that tree been there and what, what else is it sucking up from the local water supply? So those are all things that will affect a mushroom and, and most plants as well. To avoid issues there, you guys test heavily. Oh my God. Yeah. Before anything leaves our Chinese uh, processors that are, are making the extracts for us, our, our production partners, before it leaves, they're testing for pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals, uh, microbiological testing as well, you know, for bacteria, for for molds, for, for uh, E. coli, coliforms, they have to do a complete panel. And then once we get the extract and bring it in over here, then we, we do all of the testing again. So everything is tested twice before we actually release it for sale. So the testing is pretty stringent. And, and then, you know, a after that, that's when we test for beta-glucans. We test for ergosterol, which is the fungal sterile. You ever heard of ergosterol? I have. You know what's cool about ergosterol is that is a precursor to vitamin D2. Mushrooms don't have a lot of vitamin D in them. They don't, but they've got ergosterol, and if you expose those mushrooms to UV light, that ergosterol will change into vitamin D2. Just like our cholesterol, when we're out there exposing ourselves to UV and sunlight, that's what's happening. And that's how we produce our vitamin D, same, same basic principle. When you expose mushrooms, like, like, especially if you slice them up, then expose them. So you've got a lot of surface area, expose them for 30 minutes in sunlight. That will ultimately raise up that vitamin D level. You might raise those mushrooms up to 100 IUs or something like that. You can do that with any mushrooms? Yep. It's a cool little hack. Oh man, yeah, it's really cool. It, it is. It is very cool, and and uh, <clears throat> that's something that we're working on too, where we're going to be able to expose some of our mushroom extract powders to UV light, and and be able to ultimate. You know, we we have a vitamin D two product right now in the real mushrooms line, and uh, it's it's simply mushroom powder. And what's really interesting is is you know certainly for people who are vegans that don't want to. Uh, consume an animal product vitamin d3 does come from lanolin which comes from sheep's wool so it's a animal product and, and the processing of that man alive you see the processing of that it's like my god a lot of chemicals going into to basically refining it but think about it this is vitamin d that's just a mushroom powder i, I mean it's like how simple is that yeah it's so cool i, I just love the whole concept and that's D3? D2. Oh, D2. D2. And, and, you know, there's some controversy out there that says, oh, D2 is not as good as D3. But there's some pretty solid research that says, no, it's, it's the same in terms of being able to utilize D2. And if you're taking it regularly, you're going to get the same benefits as with D3. Hmm. We were talking offline about another little cool test people can do at home to determine if the mushrooms they have are what they say on the front label. Can you walk us through the iodine test? Oh yeah. What a wonderful test. You know, be, be sure and get your kids if you have them to do this as their next science project. <laughs> <laughs> Basically what, what happens is uh, uh, 
iodine will react with starch and turn colors. So what you do is you, you take a quarter cup of water and you dump a bunch of uh, whatever product you happen to have. Let's say you've got product and you, it's capsules. You dump out about uh, six capsules. You, you mix it into that quarter cup of water. You get, you know, let it get wet and, and mix up really good. And then you put in 10 drops of iodine. Now, if there is starch in that product, and remember, mushrooms do not have starch. If there's starch, it will turn black, sometimes purple black, but it will turn dark, dark, dark. That is an immediate indication that your product has got starch. And, and that's a great way to, to unmask these products that are claiming to be mushroom and claiming that, oh, the mycelium is consuming all that grain and there's no residues of it. Yeah, right. Well, we'll do the starch test and find out. And, and, and you know, with a mushroom product, you throw it in there in the mushrooms and you put the iodine in there and it should just be the iodine color and that would be it. And, and you know, the only time when it's difficult is if the actual mushroom extract that you're putting in is already dark. That makes it a little more difficult to do the test. But Otherwise, a lot of the powders are lighter colored. And so you mix it in and the, the water is still fairly light. And you put in the, the 10 drops of iodine and it's just like Im instantaneous. It's a great test. It's called the iodine starch test. All it takes is a little 2 or $3 bottle of iodine. And that product that you've got at home that you love so much, <laughs> you can try it and see what you actually have. And let me tell you, Nick, I've talked to people who at trade shows, they come up and they tell me, I love mushrooms and I've been taking this great mushroom product for years now. And I'm like, oh yeah, so what's the brand? And they tell me and I'm like, oops, I hate to tell you this. And, and this is, sometimes this is at like a paleo conference, people that don't oh. eat grains. <laughs> and I say, that product is mostly grain. <laughs> and they're like, ah, you know, it's just, it, it blows their mind. It's like, oh my God, they are, are not happy. So I have, for listeners, I have five Defenders Real Mushrooms product right here. On the back label, I'm looking at it and it, under the supplement facts, the ingredients, Real Mushrooms does list the beta glucans and the starch and the beta glucans on this says it's greater than 20% and the starch is less than 5%. So if I do the starch test, what color should I expect to see? You should, you should expect to see really nothing because, you know, the thing about it is, is although we say less than 5% starch, the thing about it is it's not starch in those mushrooms, it's glycogen. Uh -huh. So, and, and, um, you know, at, at the level of glycogen that's in there, you're not going to see any real change in the color at all. Um, so no, you won't see any color change. Yeah, do it, do it, and let me know. And if you see any color change, I'm not going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know, at least. Jeff, I know you're a huge proponent of using mushrooms in the diet, not via supplementation, but through food itself. Tell me about your use of mushrooms as food. Well, first of all, be sure you know I fry mushrooms. That's what I do with them. I mean, unless unless I'm making um, a, a soup. I always have a ton of mushrooms in any soup or stew. I'm, I love making a stew. Man, that's one of my favorite things because then once I make it, I can eat it for days. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I am a meat eater, so it's like, you know, a bunch of meat in and mushrooms and onions and potatoes and all sorts of stuff. Um, <laughs> love stew. And, and so um, use a hot pan if you're frying mushrooms. A hot pan, the oil of your choice. I I, I use normally, um, you know, I'll, I'll use either an olive oil, but this, I just recently bought some avocado oil, which is expensive, but I got it on, you know, on a nice sale. So I, but I'm going to grab this and try it. It's supposed to be good at higher temperatures, which is good. So I'm using avocado oil. I throw the mushrooms in. Maybe they're sliced a quarter of an inch thick. Hot pan, um, brown up each side. They're going to shrink. The key thing is that on a lower temperature, all the water will come uh. right out of the mushrooms. And now they're sitting in a, a pool of water. 
and they're just they, they come out of that pan soggy so unless you're making a gravy <laughs> cook them in a hot pan fry them really well so they're browned on both sides um, if I'm just going to eat them plain or, or, you know, with the, with a piece of meat or something, I'll put a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper on them and, oh, they're delicious, absolutely delicious. And that's really the key to cooking mushrooms. And that's why every five-year-old you've ever talked to said they hate mushrooms because <laughs> <laughs> they go, oh, those things are so slimy. <laughs> Yeah, I, I get it. Yes, they are. Tell your mom how to cook them. If you're listening to this program, <laughs> tell your mother or your father, whoever's cooking that night, tell them, cook those mushrooms properly. Are there specific types of mushrooms that you think that everyone should experience if they can get their hands on? Definitely. Shiitake's my favorite. Uh, another one I really love that if you can get, well, for one, uh, lion's mane, if you can get fresh lion's mane, you're really in the right place because fresh lion's mane is delicious. The other one I love is anoki mushrooms. They come in a, a shrink wrapped package. There's about a thousand of them in this package. The they've really got small ones. They've got tiny little cap. And, yeah. and real, real thin stem. So you look at that and you're like, my God, look at these things. So, so when you get them out of the package, you have to kind of like strip them out because they're all just tightly together bound. That's the way they grow. They're delicious as well. You, you fry those up and they're, they have a crunch factor to them that's really the texture's excellent. The flavor's good. So... Those are, are kind of my shiitake, uh, lion's mane, um, enoki mushroom. Those are my my favorite ones, really. I still eat a lot of agaricus because in my marketplace, um, I can only get about three mushrooms. I can get button mushroom. I can get shiitake, and I can get the enoki at one of the markets here. But, you know, I'm in a small town, so I don't get the whole you know, if you're in a city, you, you've got a much better selection of mushrooms. Um, some of the mushrooms that you might find in the markets, you might find maitake. You might find uh, what's called shimeji, which is really excellent as well. So, so yeah, um, those are my three favorites. And, and fortunately, I can get them. Now, if you're looking for mushrooms too, like if you see shiitake there and you're looking at those shiitake and they look, huh, they look a little bit ragged or maybe you turn over the and look at the gills underneath and the gills are starting to go kind of dark and maybe they've got dark spots in them or something don't buy them because that is a bacteria that's on them uh, i i was fact in my market uh one of my local markets a week ago and i was they had some anoki there which is one of the great things about that market but they had a, a big box of shiitake there and i looked at the shiitake and i went you know these shiitake should be in the dumpster they were horrible I, I mean, so in such terrible condition, uh, I went to the produce guy there. I said, hey, um, your shiitake <laughs> are sad and need to be, you, they shouldn't be on uh, out here being sold. They're terrible. And he went, oh, oh, okay, let me take a look. A lot of produce managers don't have a clue yeah. when it comes to mushrooms. And this guy probably never eaten a shiitake in his life. He's just like <laughs> dumping them out there and they're, you know, okay, the day's over. I'm going to put them back in the cooler and bring them out the next day. And I'll, I'll paw through them, fluff them up a little bit or something. It's like, yeah, they, they, they literally were dumpster material. Well, glad that you spotted it because most people probably wouldn't know the difference. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I think I don't even know if anybody would buy those things looking like uh, that because they just looked terrible, too. It just was a absolute dog's breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any particular mushrooms or active ingredients in the mushrooms that you're interested in now and researching? Well, one of them is a, is a compound called ergothionine. Ergothionine, everybody. Think about that. Look it up. It's a <clears throat> amino acid that they're, they have found in various parts of our body, especially in places where we have a lot of oxidative stress. So they're considered at this point in time to be some kind of an antioxidant, but we don't manufacture it. It can only come from external sources. And the, the, one of the best sources of ergothionine is mushrooms. 
So we test all of our products for ergothionine so that we can know what levels we should be seeing. And we also think it's something down the line that more people are going to be interested in and we will, we will guarantee for ergothionine. Um, so it looks like it's a, a major antioxidant and mushrooms are one source of it. And, and it is such an interesting compound that some researchers are actually saying that it might be a new vitamin. Wow. I know. I mean, I mean, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? You, you just to think about that. Wow, a new vitamin. How do they do that anyway? You know, it's like a vitamin. Wow, they didn't even know this was a vitamin out there. Now <laughs> it's like, wow, it's a vitamin. <laughs> so, so anyway, ergothionine is something that people are going to hear more about. And you know, the other thing about mushrooms that they've done out in Asia, they've done very, very large studies with tens of thousands of people, asking them about their diet, and what they found is that people with who say, yeah, they're eating a lot of mushrooms in their diet, they tend to live longer than people that don't. So again, look, it's the missing link. It's the forgotten food. Get it into your diet. You're going to live longer and be healthier too. I mean, that's the other side of it. You're eating a food that also has these medicinal properties to it. So it's just a fabulous food and, and a great supplement. I'm planning on having Dr. Mason Bressett of Real Mushrooms on the show later to do a deep dive of the specific mushrooms and how they're used clinically and little hacks and tips we can use to get more out of them. Awesome. Yeah. Mason is a very great student of the mushroom and he can definitely do that for you. That That's definitely a more specialized area to get into because it's like those research papers you can start to get into deep water pretty quickly yeah well jeff where can listeners that are interested in following your work connect with you well come to namex.com n-a-m-m-e-x.com uh, and go to the the menu where it says educational or news we got a lot of great information there including slideshows i've got a 30-minute slideshow on how we grow our mushrooms so that's something that's really interesting and other uh, educational materials. So come to Namex. And then we've also got a lot of great information, educational information on realmushrooms.com. So go there as well and just learn more about mushrooms and what's going on in this fabulous world of fungi. And like he said earlier, Namex is the B2B line so if you're a company that wants to use mushrooms in your products reach out to jeff at namex and on the other end if you're a consumer like me and want to pick up these products and try them yourself you can do that at realmushrooms.com and they've generously worked out an exclusive coupon code of urban and you can use that and save 10 percent. is that all <laughs> For actually, now. actually, yeah, you can do that on the, on the second time, because I think the first time you buy on real mushrooms, they give you 25% off anyway. Wow. Yeah. Mason didn't reveal that to you, huh? <laughs> yeah. The first time I ordered on real mushrooms was a long time ago. So I forget that little detail. Yeah. 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 Or maybe it was after, after uh, that or something. I don't know, but yeah, that is uh, what's going on. The first purchase, they give you 25% off. Jeff, we've been going for a while now. I have a couple more questions for you as we wind down. And this next one is one of my favorites. So let's dive in. Okay. Imagine that all knowledge is lost on earth. You get to save the three most meaningful books, podcasts, interviews, lectures, you name it, educational material of any kind. What would you choose and why? Yeah, I, I would say the f book wise, the first thing, well, I mean, most of these are books that I'm going to mention, because, you know, look, we're not going to have uh, of computers or videos or stuff like that at that point in time. So we can't play those. <laughs> but books, maybe we still can use because we don't need machinery. Um, but um, Permaculture One and Two by Bill Mollison. Those were the original permaculture books. And, you know, I mean, that's what you need to survive ultimately if you want to develop your surroundings into a food producing uh, piece of land. And, and uh, you know, the thing with permaculture is they integrate animals into it and all. So it's a fabulous way to produce 
food in a sustainable manner. So Permaculture 1 and 2 by Bill Mollison. Um, the other, which I think would be really worth having, is a human physiology textbook, mm -hmm. which, which for me is so important. And man, if you want to take a deep dive, my God, I took a course in human ph physiology in college, and it was just like, oh, there is so much to know. <laughs> I mean, there's levels there that are unreal. So human physiology and the final one, which I, you know, it's like, okay, what's the third one here? And I just thought, you know, I love language. Language for me is so cool. And one of the great linguists out there, in my opinion, in terms of the way he wrote was um, Shakespeare. And, and, you know, how many of us read Shakespeare? Well, I don't, but whenever I do, it's like, oh man, the way this guy writes, I'm just like, you know, it's poetry in a way. And, and you, you might see it in plays when they do plays and, and it's really fascinating. So that's, that's my third choice here is the complete works, not just one, <laughs> the complete works. All of them. <laughs> I'm wondering about your choice to save the human physiology textbook though because if we're still discovering new vitamins it might be incomplete yeah <laughs> true 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 yeah that that's absolutely right but you know i guess i guess my thought on that too was like okay look what if what if i get injured okay i better go to the book and see what's going on here <laughs> maybe that can help me figure this out survival manual yeah yeah in a sense it is i was thinking okay is there a medical textbook out there maybe my first aid book <laughs> Okay, well, on to the rapid fire round. What's the best or worst advice you've ever received? Well, I really think the, the best advice is um, don't worry, be happy. And the other one that I highly recommend is question authority. Don't believe all the experts. <laughs> yeah. And I'd even venture off and be a little more broad than that and just say question beliefs in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's so important to be able to make up your own mind and not just listen to someone else and go, okay, yeah, I accept that. Because that's, that's what we call being in a cult. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. What's the number one thing that you believe that virtually nobody else does? Well, I, I, I should say that there are a few other people out there that believe this, but that basically um, most major religions in the world were originally based on the use of mushrooms. Wow. And if you, and if you look, there's, there's an awful lot of information out there, if you look for it, that will demonstrate that. And that's really fascinating. And one of the things in my anthropology uh, career back in the university. That's one of the things that I was really digging into because I was really interested, fascinated by religion and, uh, you know, having grown up in Christianity and all that. So I was looking at all the different religions and well, where, where did it all start and what, what was, what it sparked this religious idea and all the rest. And well, you know, you can have these really interesting experiences that go, wow, there's something bigger and out there and and uh so anyway that's that's that most of the major religions were actually based around the use of mushrooms well you've managed to bring us full circle tying it back into mushrooms hey yeah <laughs> well jeff it's been a pleasure having you on the show how would you like to conclude our journey together tonight well i i guess the way i like to conclude it is just basically say to those people out there who are are, are not eating mushrooms. Look, it's a really tasty food. You have to prepare it properly, but it's, I think, an important food. It's what's missing in most diets. And I think it's got lots of benefits. Start out with one in particular, like maybe the shiitake, get into it, try it. Don't eat too much the first time. That's a big no-no because there's always 5% of the people out there that are allergic to any food. So be careful. Just eat a little bit, you know, and try the flavor. If you like the flavor, then eat some more the next time. But, but yeah, that's what I, I always recommend is, is get mushrooms into your diet. Jeff, 
I've loved having you on the show and thank you for all your time tonight. Hey, you, you are welcome, Nick. It's been my pleasure being here. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, information in this video is for information purposes only. Please